And we're back for another episode of Start Hustle, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. If you want to start, own, or build a business, then you're in the right place. We bring you the real truth about what it's like to take something from concept to launch, from growth, innovation, experience, failing, or winning big, we've got you covered. So let's get down to business with another episode of Start a Puzzle, brought to you by Fullscale.io. And we're back. Another episode of Start a Puzzle. Matt DeCourcy here to have another conversation that I'm hoping helps your business grow. Now, everyone's heard about artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that kind of stuff. But I think so few understand how it really works. Now, for those of you that listen to the show regularly, you know that I'm a non-technical founder. I tell people often that I write checks, not code. Why? Because it's true. Now, speaking of writing checks, I should let you know that today's episode of Start a Puzzle is brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. Now, because I can't really explain fully how machines learn, how they learn, how why is intel, why is artificial intelligence smart? What makes it happen? What is machine learning? I give you a basic idea of that, but. I've got an expert with me today. So today's guest is David Karandish. I knew I was going to mess that up, David. I'm sorry. David is the CEO and founder of Capacity. It's an AI-based startup that does all kinds of cool stuff. It's AI-based help desks and a lot of different things that I'm sure he will explain at a level that I will only partially understand. David, welcome to Startup Hustle. Thanks for having me here. Yes, yeah, so you know, are you are you willing to take on the heavy lifting here when we talk about building learning machines? A- absolutely. We'll uh, we'll go very high level and we'll get all the way down to the ones and zeros if we need to. I like it. I like it. I'm not going to be afraid to ask if I don't understand because I'm sure that the many out there listening will want me to. So let's start, you know, I I mentioned that you're the founder of Capacity, CEO and founder of Capacity. And for those of you listening, scroll down, click the show notes, capacity.com. You guys have a really cool platform. You and I have talked about this prior to today's episode where I was impressed then and I'm still impressed with what you do. But what's the backstory of yourself and Capacity? Yeah, so I've been a serial entrepreneur, been in the tech space, uh, kind of technology and entrepreneurship intersection for over 20 years. So my eighth startup, I've been a part of, I think, from a web design company to online lead gen uh, to most recently before Capacity, I was at a uh, company called Answers.com that was one of the largest online internet publishers out there. Started Capacity in January of 2017. And our whole mission is that we want to help teams do their best work. And the way we think about that is that uh, so much of your day is spent doing repetitive tasks, asking questions, and waiting for things to happen. And so our initial idea was, what if we could bring a Siri or Alexa-like experience into the workplace where you had your own uh, virtual assistant that you could ask your questions to, that kind of blossomed into this support automation platform where... Now, Capacity is taking on uh, internal support for HR and IT, as well as customer and sales support as well. Well, that, and, you know, that's a hot topic. So many different companies are experienced with different types of uh, AI, machine learning. Now, you know, when we're talking about building learning machines, you know, I think it's really easy to say that. But like, what are the basic fundamentals of artificial intelligence or machine learning? Like, and, and let's just like, we can progress through it quickly. We don't have to be fully like pre 101 stuff, but where does that start? Cause I, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of people just don't really understand like the, the basic components of, uh, of a machine learning in the same way a person does. So a lot of people have a lot of different definitions for machine learning. Uh, the way I kind of think about machine learning and AI is Think of it as uh, technology and algorithms that pick up patterns on their own and can go do things with those patterns. Ray Kurzweil has a book, uh, getting a little dated now, but called How to Create a Mind. And his whole thesis is that 
the brain is effectively a giant pattern recognition machine. Whether when you open your eyes, you see colors, you see shapes. Uh, there's part of the brain that's tuned to seeing faces and 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 uh, tied to memories and things like that. And so, effectively, what these machine learning algorithms are is they're taking the type of processing that happens in your brain with these hierarchical patterns that get detected, and they're applying it to anything from computer vision, driving a, an autonomous Uber, to uh, the algorithms that power uh, which route you should take on, on your Google Maps trip. And so I think a lot of people see machine learning and they, they think about the, the learning component, what algorithms go into that, what kind of data sets do we feed into that. We could talk about that as well. But I've actually started flipping the script a little bit and talking about learning machines as the idea of building out learning into the processes that your organization embodies, which can have artificial intelligence underlying it or not. And so we, we've kind of identified five stages of these learning machines that, that we see in organizations. I'm happy to walk through what those look like. Okay, so just to, just to keep some of this, and like I said, in this practical and palatable level, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about simplifying the user experience when, or even the support experience when it comes to software platforms, and so much of that is is an echo that you hear. It's the same question, it's the same concern, it's the same objection surfacing over and over and over. And much like you said, we're looking for pattern recognition. So, you know, regardless regardless of what type of startup you have or business that you run or manage, it's likely that there is a very small list of problems or like and I said in a sales setting, it's always an objection. Now, an objection isn't a bad thing. I've had salespeople like, ah, this person, should, they just have all these objections. That actually means they're interested. Now, one of the things that's important when someone's interested or has an issue or something they want to solve is getting them quickly to the solution or the explanation. So at, at Capacity, and once again, go down to the show notes and click, go to capacity.com. That's kind of the fundamental place that you start at, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, objection handling is a great segue to how to think about building your own learning machine for your organization. So uh, if I look at the first stage of a, uh, of a learning machine, I call it a non-machine first. That's where you've got an organization that's taking something like objection handling and everyone's doing their own thing. They're all recording in different places, different ways. There's no uniformity to that. The second stage of building out your learning machine is saying, okay, we need a descriptive machine so that whether you're doing the sales call or I'm doing the sales call or whoever's doing the sales call, we're all recording it in a consistent manner, in a consistent place uh, so that we can all have what, one kind of source of truth for that data. Now, a descriptive machine is not a learning machine yet. It's, it's not sufficient, but it is necessary to get your learning machine going. The next stage after a descriptive machine uh, would be a predictive machine. And a predictive machine would be where we look and we say, okay, from the last 50 calls, when somebody asked about price, this happened. This sale went up or this uh, qualification question came next. Or when people asked, how does your deployment model work? When we responded this way, we landed these deals. When we responded this other way, these things didn't close. And so it's actually predicting and saying, okay, here's how you should handle, uh, handle those, uh, those particular, uh, particular items. The prescriptive machine kind of takes it the next, uh, the next way down is saying, okay, we're not only going to predict your behavior, but we're going to prescribe what to do when a string of these individual objections come up to actually help the, the, the sales agent get better. And then ultimately the, the fifth or the, the highest order machine, the, the automated prescription machine would be imagine you're on the phone with a prospect and that prospect uh, asks you some kind of objection and the machine itself is coming back to you and saying, uh, here's what you should do and prescribing what, what that next action should be. Now, that I'm using this as a generic model that you can apply across your, your business. Uh, we're talking about objection handling, but those same five stages can apply uh, pretty much to any part of your organization. 
I think where a lot of people get tripped up is that not every part of your organization needs to be a level five automated prescriptive machine, or, but it behooves you as an organization to look and count the cost and say, okay, what would it take for us to move from a non-machine to a descriptive machine, from a descriptive machine to a predictive machine, et cetera. And so part of what we've been doing is our platform uh, helps provide the underpinning for you to automate the key processes you have in your in your org, whether it's onboarding a new team member, whether it's upgrading someone's account, whether it's helping you figure out what what sales prospects to go after, pulling information from documents. These are all tasks we do over and over again that are very mundane and not uh, not good for humans. And so uh, we've been really excited to bring this technology into the marketplace and see it start to get implemented across the board. I, I actually find that to be a very palatable sequence there. I mean, the, like, and by default, any business when you open it is that non-machine setting. That's kind of like you're up by default a sole proprietor before you create an entity, you know? And it's, exactly. Uh, and, you know, so based on that, and, you know, we've spent a lot of time, and I have, saying that one of the hardest parts about startups or entrepreneurship is that these darn things don't come with an owner's manual. And, you know, for, for an entrepreneur that, that opens a, a chain of Subway restaurants, the advantage that they have is that someone else has made it further down this line. Now, I, I picked a very non-tech approach there, but literally Subway could probably tell you exactly what to look for if someone asks for this, 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 or this. But in the, in the beginning, so that, that non-machine that's at, you're at this point. You're trying to figure out like what are you're listening for the echo still, and I, and I say echo because I find that to be a palatable approach too. So many of the things that that people have problems with, whether it's with your product or your approach to getting them to use it, are very are very predictable. They are uh, like, for example, we went through this with Gigabook. We had noticed that a lot of people are asking about the pers- uh, the uh, subscription rates. Which told me first off that we weren't doing a very go- a good job of describing how they worked, so we hadn't yet made it to that that descriptive machine stage. Now, with that, uh, if they were asking, it's because they were interested. And the thing that scared the hell out of me was for every person that asked, I was sitting at the office going, "How many people aren't asking and are leaving?" So, you know, that descriptive machine stage is when you really need to outline the whole everything, you know, like control that narrative. Cause you know, so many entrepreneurs that I talk to are busy trying to figure out what they're going to do to prevent the sky from falling. You should be spending more time figuring out what can and will happen when things go well. And, you know, full scale, who's the sponsor of this episode and the company that I'm the CEO is we went from zero to 200 employees in two years. And the amount of descriptive everything that we had to create, it was intense, dude. It was like really intense. It. And everything from salespeople to HR to like all of it. And, you know, so we had to pay a lot of attention to that and really kind of get, and, and fine tune it. So, you know, now when a business gets to the predictive part is that that's the, that's when you're now beginning to enter the realm of a true of, of any type of machine learning is that correct? Yeah, let me. I'll use another another practical example. One one of our clients is a uh, large hybrid uh, university. Started out on campus, they added an online program ten years ago. Now they have more online students than campus students. And now everyone is probably online, but that's a separate story. Um, but they they ran into this issue where they said we're having a difficult time figuring out who is likely to complete their degree and who isn't. We don't have the same face-to-face time. We can't just walk down to the quad and have a conversation. These students are all over the, the country, some of them all over the world. They might be taking classes at 11 o'clock at night. How do, we, how do we tackle this problem? So first on the descriptive machine, uh, they said, well, let's, let's start centralizing recording all the information we have on the student. Do we know what your incoming GPA is? Do we know what your uh, major is? Do we know if you're on a scholarship or not? 
And they're able to take all that information, put it into one data store, and then start doing the predictive machine of saying, okay, if you're a first-time college student and you, uh, you're taking a class that's not in your major and you didn't read the syllabus, your likelihood of completing that class actually starts to go down substantially. So they could predict your likelihood to uh, effectively complete a class. And if you aggregate that up over enough classes, you could now predict someone's graduation rate. Well, the prediction is great, but what do you, what do you go to do with it? Well, you can't uh, physically meet with every student across the entire country when they're online, but you can start to triage and say, oh, is this an A student that happens to not do well in statistics? Okay, you know, they're going to be fine. Or is it a C minus student who's really struggling to make it through school? Uh, we might need to intervene by doing a Zoom call or sending an email or doing a phone call to try to figure out what, what we can do to help this student out. And so ultimately where they want to get to, and we're not there yet, is they want the automated prescriptive machine of being able to say, okay, for every student across all of these different programs, let's go and in an automated fashion, send out um, effectively a message to their life coach program that says, hey, life coaches, you don't need to worry about all 5,000 students. Here are the 50 that are most at risk, that are most uh, likely to, to need extra help. And here's how you, here's how you can go interact and uh, engage with them. So from speaking with past guests on the show, one of which was uh, Chris Cheatham at Risk Genius, and that's an insurance technology company. And they would like, you know, that reads policies over like millions of policies. And, you know, like it, basically what that was trying to do is prevent loss or lack of coverage. And, you know, that that the, the question is, is and I think you kind of proved this by with your statement, we're not there yet, was being able to deploy that solution quickly. And, you know, because so much of, well, the insurance industry can tell you, it, it, they can pretty much tell you when you're going to die, you know, and, and with, with, a, with a strange degree of accuracy. And that's because they have massive data sets. Now, what they would probably be providing a better service if they would have told me all the changes I needed to make in my lifestyle when I was 27, not 45 or 65. So, you know, both with capacity and what you guys do, now, you guys are, are helping uh, streamline support and not only for the employee, but for the, the, for the client or user, right? Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things that's... So how, how do you arrive at that solution quickly? Like, how do you deliver that? How do you speed that up? Because some of these things begin to get to the point where they need a pretty quick solution. Finding out a year later that X, that these 50 students had already dropped out is too late. Yeah, great question. So the, the first thing is we, we want to set expectations with our clients that you don't want to skip the stages. We have clients that want to go straight to stage five automated prescriptive machines, and they don't even have their act together in terms of keeping their data in one consistent format. And so uh, our ability to hit the gas and move quickly, uh, a lot of times it comes down to the client's willingness to say, okay, we're all in. We believe in the approach. We're going to standardize where our data lives, and then we're going to effectively aggregate the, the statistical analysis that comes out the other end to say, are these predictions accurate and are these prescriptions leading to the outcomes that we want? And to use that example I was just talking about, predicting someone's likelihood to complete an entire degree program actually takes a lot of work. But if you zoom in and say, okay, what's your likelihood to complete one single class? You can then roll that out to the next class, to the next class, to the next class, and then pretty soon the aggregate results, much like your insurance example, uh, can, can tell a great story. Very difficult to say who's going to die today, but you can say statistically who's likely to pass away in the next year. Very similarly uh, with the class graduation, you want to be able to look and say, okay, who is most at risk? Let's go target that group first and continue to refine our algorithms as we go along. So yeah, I'll give you a, a, a real world example that's not necessarily about learning machines, but a lot of times we'll talk to clients at full scale that they'll say, well, we want to automate our QA testing. 
And my first question is, Artie, do you know how to do it manually? Because right. absolutely, without, I mean, because because you 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 can't train a machine to automate tests. Like, what are you testing? What's the desired outcome? What's the undesired outcome? And and it's shocking because you mentioned like you saying most people want to skip to the, the fifth step. I was like, oh god, that really makes a lot of sense. And you know, I do give that feedback. I said, well, if you haven't done it, maybe, like, do you have test cases? You know what you want to test? Like, what's good? What's bad? So when we say building learning machines, the machines they do a degree of learning on their own, but it's still very interactive with the human mind and decision making process at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that the the difference between stage four and stage five is that in stage four, you might have a model that does a great job of giving your prescriptions, but you have to f- still feed that data back in and do a lot of training. Stage five, in my mind, is when the machine is is running continuously on its own and you don't need human input to go in and, and, and tweak things. Think about uh, Google doing their own their own search results, right? If, if everyone from Google took a holiday, it's not like Google goes down. They can, they're continuing to spider the web. The machines are running behind behind the scenes. I think what, what ends up happening though is that to your point, a lot of people want to automate something that they haven't, they haven't documented the manual steps on first. And therefore they're like, I don't know why this is so difficult to, to automate. It's like, well, first give us the manual version and then we'll, let's go run that simulation thousands or, or hundreds of thousands or millions of times over and we can go uh, create the automated version next. So when it comes to building learning machines, if you're not able to do what you just described, does that make it fairly impossible to arrive at a at a effective or usable solution or does it just make it take a hell of a lot longer? Great question. I think the the one of the biggest challenges that we found is that a lot in a lot of our clients, the learning comes from multiple systems. So this I'll use this school example. They had one student record database over here. They had a uh, a, prof, a class listing database over there. They had some online courseware that they had to integrate with, and then they had a fourth uh, a fourth uh, registration system. And so any one of those, uh, if we were just working within that system, this would be fairly easy to, to pull together. But the reality is to build the model we were looking at, we needed to pull from all four of them, normalize the data into one format, have that data be updated in a consistent manner, and then uh, run your predictive analytics on top of that. And so uh, any one of those steps could be done but a lot of times what we found is that companies are not good at data aggregation, which is the first step of that descriptive machine, which then makes all of the prediction and prescriptions impossible to do if you don't have the data described well. So uh, I mentioned that I'm not a technical founder, meaning I don't write code. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't dove in to figure some of this stuff out. And I've done some some light research. And I say that with, a, with an interesting look on my face about data science. Now, um, one of the things, you know, the, the data science industry uh, holds hands. Uh, a lot of machine learning developers or AI people will also refer to themselves as data science. Now, you have two different kinds of data, and data is everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. Like, whether, if you have a cert, if you have any software as a service platform and anybody's doing anything in it, you probably have logs of all that data and a lot of different stuff. Whether you know it or not, it's probably in there. Now, data comes into, it's, it's either structured or unstructured. And the one thing I learned, much like your point with the four different systems, that's super common because there's usually not one uh, one-stop shop that has everything you need. Is the way so a structured data is actually organized and has some thought behind the way it can be presented or viewed. Unstructured data is that raw, unfiltered. It's kind of like a 
I've compared it to that, uh, the, the thing my kids have, the sprinkler that looks like the hair shooting in a million <laughs> different directions. You know, it's like just going yeah. everywhere. Where is it where you have the structured sprinkler, which evenly distributes water in a back and forth method across my lawn. And I, I know I can water a certain spot. Now, I mentioned I would be I would play the role here where we're going to make this very palatable. So, you know, how much of how much of of your clients or your users data capacity is is usually structured compared to unstructured and how difficult is it? Cuz you get it from four different places. It's the equivalent of like having four different spreadsheets with four different headers and you're like, "Hey, make these match." And you're like, "Shit, that's going to be harder than it sounds." So like, what kind of problems do you run into with that? And how, how do we solve that on the way to the prescriptive machine? Yeah, great, great, uh, great insight into that. And I, I the visual of the, of the sprinkler with the hair is, is a great, uh, great representation of what it, what it feels like in a lot of our, a lot of our clients. Uh, what, one of the things that I've noticed is that I, I would, I, I was push back, push back on one point. Which is that I think that the structured, unstructured, it's not actually bimodal, it's a continuum. Right? So you have a database on one end, completely structured, you can query it, it's all organized, et cetera. Then on the other end, you've got some notes document, there's no format, there's no, you know, it, it's one of a kind. What we find is that people tend to know what to do with their databases in general. And they tend to be okay with finding their completely unstructured documents. The part in the middle, though, the murky middle, is the semi-structured document. It's the contract that follows a formula, except in the cases where it has these exceptions. Or it's the escrow agreement. That, 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 that was like on- what Risk Genius did. Yeah, that's like what yeah. Risk Genius was doing. I'm sorry to interrupt, but like I'll give you an example. Like Chris sat there on the, on the episode and told us, he's like, cause uh, you know, uh, Northwestern mutual has a policy and then it gets iterated like thousands of times across branch. And on next thing, you know, like technically it is thousands of different documents. So it's like more about like, shit, what are we promising that we might not be able to support? Yeah. So I, I, I believe that there's a, uh, there, there's a, there's a large mass of semi-structured data that live within these organizations where a person can go in and say, oh, this contract is 37 pages long, but there are really only a handful of things I care about. The start date, the end date, the price, is it signed, and the indemnification clause. You give me those five questions, I can probably get you 90% of the value of that 37-page document. But that 37-page document might come in four different flavors depending on the, the time series or the client or the or the format. And so the, the way that we've thought about it is that uh, when we when we work with a client, we start out by first just asking them, is this an, a structured document like a spreadsheet or a database? Is it an unstructured document that you just want to search? Or is it a semi-structured document where you're going to see multiple of this type, but they're going to vary? And then depending on which slot you fall into, we'll have a different uh, kind of course of action that we go down. Uh, we think that there are a lot of great providers out there doing the uh, document extraction. Uh, we're, we're doing some of that ourselves, only, if only for just the need of, of, of our clients needing us to do it. But at the end of the day, what, what we're trying to do is move as much of the unstructured side of the spectrum onto this structured side so that you can ask questions like, you know, compare these two contracts. What are the differences? What's uh, expiring this month? Or show me the last time we gave on this particular clause. Uh, those are the types of questions that a lot of our, our document savvy customers want to be able to ask. And we're, we're finding that that, uh, that use case comes up more and more um, as we get in and start automating. Okay. So, and back to the, you know, we've got five steps, according to David, we have the non-machine, the descriptive machine, the predictive machine, the prescriptive machine and the auto prescriptive. Now, is it a math, is it a huge jump from three to four? Cause I feel like predictive is fairly straightforward. Like that's finding correlations and comparisons, right? That's like, 
Like if David, if David says this, he's 80% likely to become a, to sign up afterward. But the prescriptive part requires a lot more. That's almost like a, a empathy. You know, there's a little different understanding of the problem and the solution. And then according to your original explanation, that can also be several tiers. It can be a different connection. Like it's the, okay, so if thens. And I am smart enough to know this part, like if this, then that. Now, the thing is, is it sounds straightforward when you go from step one to step two, step two to step three. The thing that I think most people don't understand is it's not just three times harder to be at that third level. It's actually exponential. So that third, getting to that third step is probably nine times harder than even arriving at at a single case. Is that correct? 100%. 100%. Each step gets harder and harder to, to accomplish, and it is on an exponential exponential scale. Uh, you also get exponential benefits from, uh, yeah, from right, getting right. farther along down, down, down the way as well. Uh, one thing I'd say from the jump from three to four that we've seen is that uh, a lot of times the, the challenge isn't that people don't already have prescriptions going on. It's that they're prescribing things to do based on their predictions, but those prescriptions need to feed back into the machine as an input. So that, mm. that is the crux of the difference between stage three and stage four is the prescriptions of what you do. So somebody had a problem, we called them. Somebody had a problem, we emailed them. Somebody, we had a, pro- somebody had a problem, we texted them. Well, uh, you may have resolved that in all three cases or one out of three cases or two out of three cases. That resolution needs to be fed back into the machine, knowing that each of those resolutions might not have the same level of cost function as well. So it may be very cheap to send out a text resolution to a student that's trying to log into their uh, their Canvas instance, uh, but that may not may or may not be as effective as getting on the phone. Conversely, getting on the phone may, may have a high effectiveness rate if the person will pick up the phone, uh, but a high cost associated with it as well. And so the prescriptions have to include a cost associated with their prescription. Uh, otherwise, uh, they, they, don't, they don't take in the full, the full account. And so that's so, part of what me, makes four a, harder than three. I'm going to take a stab at, at making my sprinkler comparison again, but and maybe it's not the same comparison, but what you just described, okay, so let's say that capacity or any learning machine, and by the way, I want to say I'm really impressed with what you guys have built in such a short amount of time. It's, Thank it's you. Because the complexity here, you guys offer solutions for so many different types of businesses, and and it's, you know, I can tell it's very well put together, but so if you're, so if the machine prescribes that I call a client, and resolve an issue, it doesn't have any way of knowing whether that was effective or not, unless I, the caller, say, yes, it worked, or no, it didn't, or maybe even a series of different questions, like getting down to the true why. So we are, in fact, in a somewhat empathetic stage of understanding, meaning like, it, you know, like, why didn't it work? Like, that is really, truly a understand, like the, the a machine knowing why is a different than how, like the, you know, there's a, there's so many levels, like why didn't this person buy? And, and so does that become grossly more difficult to measure based on human input or do you just structure those responses and replies and in the same way that you might specific types of data? I, I think it becomes harder to capture partly because the, the human can have a difficult time indicating the why. Right. Why, why did yeah, this, that's, why that's did my this point. Is how, explain why. Well, I don't know if you're any good at what you do. Maybe, maybe you were just a shitty caller. Maybe you're not very good at helping our clients, but maybe the other guy that's across the cubicle from you is the best. And that's my point is that's got to be really difficult. Yeah. So one of the, what's the classic, like you add the five whys, you ask five whys to get to the, to get to the root answer. Uh, so sometimes you, uh, what I'm we found is that if, it. <laughs> if you, if you just ask the top level, why, well, why didn't the sale go through? Well, uh, they, they had competing priorities. Why did they have competing priorities? 
well, because they just implemented this other system. Well, why are they having so many problems with this other system? Because you know, you, you follow it to its, oh, oh well, ultimately uh, they're going in this direction that we actually have a product or a solution for and we didn't pitch it and that, that's how you're, you want to go bridge it. And so I, I think the, at the same time though, uh, a lot of, a lot of the time it's not, hey, you're going to go implement these things and all of a sudden your sales are going to go through the roof. Now, if, you make, if you make a salesperson 10% better, like that's a huge deal. You make a salesperson 20% oh, better. That's huge, huge. Huge, yeah. right? You, you, yeah. make your, you reduce your customer yeah. support. We had one client where in an 18-month span, they doubled their, as a financial services client, they doubled their assets under management. They rolled out our technology onto their website we were able to cut their call volume into their call center by 25% and their net promoter score went up by 10 points over that same time frame. So did we, did we reduce their calls to zero? No. But if we cut down a quarter of their calls while they doubled their business and created a better customer experience, like this is, this is exactly what we need out of our technology. And our technology is actually not here to take the human out of the equation. It's actually to make a more human experience and not less time on the phone waiting, less time, uh, you know, trying to figure out who can help answer my question, that sort of thing. You know, I made a comment on someone, someone had posted uh, a Facebook, an article on Facebook over the weekend talking about robotics and AI and, and, you know, had made a comment that said, uh, it, it was actually, it was a robot that uh, drives down the aisle at Walmart and it scans for inventory and different stuff like that. And the, and the, the comment was, well, is this going to take people's jobs? Yeah, I, I think a lot, I think so many people don't understand how difficult it is to find people to do jobs like that and, but, and not leave, you know, like the churn, like that does not sound like a job that most people aspire to do. Like when I was five, I wasn't going, man, that's really what I want to do. So, you know, so many of the things that, that AI and machine learning, we'll talk about that at the end about how this affects the workplace in general. So many of these things, either the data sets are so massive or they're just very difficult to, you know, like some of these things are repetitive. And, you know, one thing that I want to encourage all of you to keep in mind is anytime you call a customer support, a service or a help desk, any of that, nobody ever calls those people to tell them how much they love the product. Um, it's like, I mean, one thing that we don't need AI to predict is that they're having a problem, they have a complaint or they need some kind of solution. And that's tough. Like those aren't the, those aren't the, that's not the most popular job at the company. Like being the deflector, the deflector shield for all of the company's bullshit. And, you know, so that said, I mean, really you have a healthier, better company when you can make the overall client or user experience that much sooner. Really people just want to get to the, they want a quick answer to the problem. And, you know, now with that, the fifth and the highest stage, the the uh, the the auto prescriptive field. Now, I I'm willing to bet that the, that that level, which sounds a lot like self actualization, according to Abraham Maslow, like knowing you're getting everything that you wanted out of life, um, which this is the machine version of. Like when your computer is auto prescriptive, you have done a good job raising it. It has lived in a full and useful existence. And it now <laughs> feels like it is doing everything that it can or could do as a machine. It's like when data from Star Trek had the empathy chip in him, exactly. he became a person. The problem was he, didn't he inherently, didn't he like almost become kind of shitty right away because of that though? I can't remember like, or did he have a different chip that was like the evil chip? I don't know. But the thing is, is like the auto prescriptive, like does that require massive amounts of data and input at this point? Like, I mean, when I say massive, just meaning like you aren't going to have 10 use cases on your way to auto prescriptive. It requires a sufficient amount of data depending on the uh, types of decisions you're making. So if you're trying to have an automated prescriptive machine for driving a car, you sure want a lot of training data so you're not yeah, confusing sure. a person yeah. with a red shirt and a red stop sign together. Uh, if you are trying to optimize, say, what uh, offer you show on your website, 
you want data, but you, you, don't, you might not need billions of data points to make that happen. So you, you'll need to risk adjust that depending on the, the stakes of what you're looking at. But, but I think it, just as important as the amount of data, uh, it, you would really want to look at the, the feedback loop and the speed in which you can feed the data back in uh, all the way through. So going back to the earlier example on do you, do you call someone, do you email them, or do you text them? Well, you don't actually need that much data to start making an automated prescription. But if you can't feed that feedback loop in and you have to manually keep putting the data in, was that, was that prescription successful or not? Then you're going to get stuck. You're going to hit the, the level four uh, ceiling where uh, moving from four to five becomes that much more difficult. And a lot of times because those, those responses uh, or those outcomes are, are not occurring in the same time or the same session as when your, your initial prescription goes out, uh, making sure you have the full capture of the feedback loop is so important. So is, is the fifth level of this, is that pretty uncommon for companies that aren't like Facebook or, you know, just the, the, the mega corp? The, the fifth level is why an Amazon is so friggin' successful. And it's why all of these other organizations in the retail category are trying to catch up to Amazon. And I think you could apply the same thing to Google or to Facebook or to a small handful of, of, of successful companies. But increasingly, the cost of getting to level five involved in internal expenditure on research and development and and platforms and building and software where where you you really couldn't get there unless you had that expertise in-house now as vendors like capacity and our our best competitors out there uh as we are platformizing that is the word the the types of things that amazon has been doing for years we're now able to go into a mid-market size company and say, hey, we're going to help you compete uh, by bringing this kind of automated prescription technology to work, as long as you can get through the, the first first four stages as well. Well, that's part of why I asked, because I obviously in the evolutionary process of business process, and you look at anything from the assembly line on, um, it, it becomes, it, it eventually reaches the point where businesses of all sizes can grasp it. And that's what I think is really cool. You know, we're living in this golden age of, well, you, I'll use your phrase, platform, platformization. And that's, so that's part of what capacity does is you're, is you're offering a, a, a blueprint or a roadmap to get closer to that fifth step without, the user having to dump tons of money. You don't have to be the industry leader. Like it's okay to to follow at these points because then yeah, I mean, most of us aren't Amazon or Google or any of these companies. Like, it, it, you, and it, I mean, it, this is correct, right? Absolutely. And and like I mentioned earlier, so much of the challenge before we get to step four or five, it's just getting to step two where we're getting right. all the data oh, yeah. into one consistent manner and we're talking with all of our key systems, if you get to there, then that, that sets you up for stages two through five. And I, I think that there are companies that do stage two well, there are companies that might do stage three or four well, but very few companies that we've seen can go th- help you work through all five stages depending on the scenario you're in. Okay, so one of the it's been a hot topic, uh, just AI in general, and hopefully for those of you listening to yet another episode of Start a Puzzle brought to you by Fullscale.io, where we don't use artificial intelligence to help you build a software team quickly and affordably. That said, we have actually tinkered with some things. We have started. Uh, we survey our clients on the way in and and ask some specific questions that are intended to match them up with the service provider that best fit them. We just, you know, don't have millions of them. So 
uh, maybe we'll get there. Maybe we'll get there. But this is going to affect, you know, AI, machine learning, robotics, all this stuff. Um, you know, help desk automation, so much of it is going to impact the workplace going forward. And I'd like to talk about that, uh, you know, as we move towards a, completing our journey through building learning machines. But how do you see AI inf- uh, uh, impacting the workplace in the future? I think the first thing you're going to see is that there are going to be companies that adopt AI early on and it becomes a best practice center for that org. And you've got other companies that will be left behind. And so you'll eventually have companies that will say, oh, I, I like working at this company because they've automated their HR systems. So I don't have to go talk with someone when I want to know what my vacation balance is. Or you're going to have a competitive advantage from a hiring perspective when people say, oh, yeah, um, I... I like doing customer service at a fairly high turnover job at this particular organization because they've automated the pieces that are, are mundane and, and are not, um, yeah, you know, not higher level thinking for me. And so I think what you're going to first see, and you're, you're already starting to see the, first, the, the initial glimpses of this, is that people will start to attract, uh, people will be, start to be attracted to companies that have have placed an AI level at the foundational level of everything that they do. Now, it doesn't mean that everything's going, every process in every company, it will be a level five automated prescription uh, machine on day one, but it does mean that they're laying the foundation for it so that they can scale. Uh, The other thing that I think you're going to see is that there's going to be this shift from, you know, a lot of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that people have uh, related to, is an AI going to take my job? Is an AI going to uh, be my rival to, wow, I really want to use this AI to complete my job faster, better, uh, smarter. And so you're going to see a lot more, not people versus AI, AIs. You're going to see people working with AIs uh, where your ability to work with an AI stack will become a big part of your resume because people will on the, on the employer side will start hiring for people who know how to work within within these AI ecosystems. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think so much about all this stuff, whether it's the now of it or the future, is just getting people to answer to a question faster and preventing businesses from the burden of potentially... Now, keep in mind, people are asking questions for a reason, and it's because they want something. And and if it's about your service or your platform, and, you know, go check out Capacity. It's pretty easy to find, capacity.com. Um, finding good service and support people is difficult. And um, once again, the reason for that is because no one's usually calling support to, okay, I think you can confirm that... 1% or less of all inbound anything at a support department is like, I just wanted to call and say, you guys are awesome. It just yeah. doesn't happen. It's just not the way it goes. And, you know, the thing is, is, is the more, the longer it takes to get an answer, the longer it takes to get help, the longer it takes to get support. And I love the fact that you guys work with employees and the user or the client because it's a two-way street, people. So if if employees are frustrated or you not doing things because of this or that, and they have that, I got to you know, I, I signed up for this company because of its great benefits, but I can't get anyone to tell me what the hell they are, you know, and exactly. or how to get help or a lot of that. And, you know, you think about it from a business perspective, like it, uh, if you can get a lot of the garbage out of the way and, and just automate these simple, basic things, how much can you accomplish organizationally? Because, you know, if they're talking, I mean, these are people that are paid well in many cases, and they're using bandwidth and time to answer questions that should inherently be answered. And so much of that, it probably does start 
with your own inability to describe your product, your service, your anything. And that's back to that very basic non-machine stage where if you can't have a, you know, a dis- if you can't describe what you do, how you do it or, or handle the objections, which I will almost guarantee you is very repeatable on a very manual level. Like I've been in sales and business for a long time. People typically have the exact same questions about something. Now you can, you also move yourself to a higher evolution of general messaging by learning how to answer some of these questions on your website. You don't like the, I mentioned Gigabook when we had started, we were getting like every day people were asking us about the subscription rates. That was a huge problem. We made a video. It was a one minute video. It's like the Matt yeah. DeCourcy production special. I didn't even, I didn't hire anybody. I did it myself on my Mac. That said, it answered the, we stopped getting that question. And it, you know, that's not a question we, we should have had to answer anyway. So, you know, you can get a lot out of AI. You can get a lot out of just understanding this basic part of, like, I think that, that this wasn't just a lesson in building learning machines. This is just kind of a lesson in understanding your own business on some levels. Like, I mean, if you can't describe it, why would you expect your users or potential clients to understand it? So I, I refer to this a lot as fact shaping, David. Like there's an, it, much like the exponential nature of, of things start to stack up with if then scenarios, you ha- literally have an unlimited number of ways that you can deliver any message. So some of them have to be better. Like what's a better word uh, if you're describing your own services, cheap or affordable? Because it's, a, I'll tell you, it's affordable. Cheap is compared with something that breaks, that's trash, that's junk. Yep. So, but they, they both just, they are both can be used to describe what you do. So it's not like I mentioned full scale doing quickly and affordably. Okay. Then now fast is a different, as a different word than quickly, but fast is also sometimes uh, sometimes in that, in the, in the realm of cheap, fast, yep. cheap and fast, you know? So, you know, there's, there's different ways to, uh, to fire up your descriptive machine. We'd probably need to do a whole nother episode with that. Now that said, it is time for the founders freestyle. So as the founder of capacity and go to capacity.com to learn more about what they do, um, what's some, what's some, advice that you could give to startup founders when it comes to using your tech or just learn building learning machines in general at their own startup? I'll I'll leave with three pieces of advice. The first is look at your internal processes and assess which ones have the best potential impact to be automated. Uh, one of my uh, friends, Sam Charrington, has three rules for looking at good candidates for automation. He talks about the one second rule. If a human can do something in a second, it's probably a good task to be automated. He talks about the probability rule. On uh, If you have a probability kind of weighted outcome, uh, it's a good task where a human can look at it because you, you're just trying to move the probability distribution up a bit. And then the X marks the data rule when you're trying to find the specific data point uh, that drives the model. That's another good good example where automation can happen. The second thing I would say is that uh, when, you, when you think about building your own experiences, if you're a startup founder, you will likely have some type of support needs. Uh, start from day one with a we, – obviously, we stand by our products and we, we – we would love to help you, but there are other great folks out there too. So do your do your homework, but work with a platform like Capacity, uh, so that you're building your support foundation from the very beginning to have an automated experience as part of it. And then the third thing I would say is that I would be asking myself, how is this type of automation going to fundamentally change the way that people do business in the space that I'm in? Um, how is how I, you know, I was talking with uh, someone earlier today, and they uh, effectively left their role as a financial advisor because they said, "We believe that I believe that automation is going to come in and change change what I used to do day in and day out." And so, uh, I think those areas where automation is going to come in and uh, fundamentally disrupt those are some of the biggest areas of opportunity for a new startup. Look for those. 
and ask yourself, hey, can I can I be with with that automation tailwind? Can that help propel me forward? Or is that something that's going to be a headwind that keeps me down? I appreciate the answer. I'm competing. By the way, I'm competing with a child shoving a keyboard under my door right now in the room that I'm recording. So fortunately, we didn't all have to hear that. Now, that's not a solution I can automate. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I'm going to parlay off you a little bit here. You talk about internal processes. Um, you know, sometimes when it comes to, to figuring out how to be more efficient, you can just look at a process and ask, do I even need to do this at all? The, Absolutely. The, the fastest way to create efficiency is to just stop doing something. Now, maybe you do need to do it, but, um, you know, and, and I think you got to ask, can I do this 10 times faster or 10 times cheaper? Or what would things look like if we did? Now, once again, so many of the things that you need and want to automate in your business are likely driven, you know, like they're not the things that people want to do anyway. Like talk to your own staff. Like sometimes in the past, and I've, and I've done a lot of business process automation um, and my businesses. And, it, you know, it starts with just some general communication. Hey, what's something that you're doing that's really repetitive? And get and get some analysis behind it. Like, you know, like Heather spends 20 hours a week doing just this. And those are good candidates for automation. Like when and where are you going to make the biggest dent overall? Like you talk well, about one, automation helping and go ahead. And one, one secret is that people love to tell you about the things that they have to do over and over again that they can't stand. Yeah. Like it's a great way to get yeah. your client talking. Just ask them. It, well, it's a great way to get your employees talking too. And your yeah. employees talking too. Yeah. You go both, both cases. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, now the thing is, is in, in my book, Million Dollar Bedroom, I talked about creating efficiency and some different stuff. And, you know, that was a business that we literally doubled our, we doubled our revenue over the second half of its, of its whole timeline. And we did not have to increase the number of employees because we got better at automating things. And it was everything from putting items in our point of sale system to invoicing, to collection of certain things. And, and, you know, like, if you have a jar of change, and this is where I'll kind of end, if you have a jar of change on the the uh, on your dresser in your bedroom, you invariably one day you put a nickel in it, the next day you put 13 cents in, maybe 82 cents another day, maybe you go big and you put a dollar bill in it occasionally. Eventually, you take that thing wherever you take it to cash that stuff in, and you're like, oh, whoa, that was like 400 bucks. The automation at your business is very similar. It's it's you're not going to probably find something that just comes in like a silver bullet and takes care of all of it. It's about a little collection. It's about pennies, nickels, dimes, and those are often represented by payroll. <laughs> you know, payroll um, and and just other stuff. And you know, certain things too is just sometimes just a better sense of efficiency. You mentioned Amazon. Um, and why, you know, why they're where they are. I mean, that's because they have figured out, they literally will count steps, like, and so much of it, you know, like, uh, well, for, you know, they, they literally build workstations and do different stuff. So, okay, because if you have to just turn, grab something and then turn back, that might not seem like a whole lot of effort or energy in one action. Well, here's the thing is now if you have uh, 200,000 people that are all taking one unnecessary step per hour, scale that up, multiply it. And next thing you know, you're into millions and billions of steps and you're paying someone to make that step. It's unnecessary. It might not seem like a big deal, but you know, but it can be. And then my final note on this is just look at your own business and try to say, where does, where does things stop? Where does, where does everything seem to be in motion? And then it just stops or it pauses or it's, you know, something is holding it up kind of like a, you know, a dam and, and how do you break that open and let things flow? Cause there's oftentimes, well, okay. So a lot of companies that sell a product have this problem when it comes to, for, for example, shipping labels. So yep. maybe they, everything, they box it up, they get it going. Now someone's got to stop and like manually create a label. 
So now if your business gets moving and things get growing, not only does not addressing that, is that going to get in the way of you selling stuff? It could actually like be very harmful to your business because much like the old I Love Lucy episode where she's at the cake factory and it's just rolling down and it's coming faster and next thing you know, they're piling up. Like eventually that stuff does get a little overwhelming. It leads to stressed out employees. It leads to stressed out clients, which will lead to you being stressed out of the business owner. All right. So check this stuff out, people. I mean, look, it, you don't have to be an AI developer, a data scientist, a robotics engineer to get stuff like capacity going at your business. There's a ton of solutions out there for a ton of different things. One thing I will tell you is you are guaranteed to miss 100% of the shots you don't take. See you next time. Thank you.